Uh, good afternoon. I would like to welcome you all to, on behalf of the Middle East Institute Center for Turkish Studies and the Institute for Turkish Studies, I would like to welcome you all to a very timely event. Um, the Obama administration has been trying to build a coalition in its fight against Islamic State and Turkey is uh, expected to play an important role in there and if you're following the news, Prime Minister Erdogan just yesterday signaled that Turkey might become uh, part of the military coalition so now there's a huge debate on uh, what exactly Turkey will, will do. So we have a great panel today um, and without further ado I would like to turn it over to my colleague Sinan Ciddi, who is the, the director of the Institute for Turkish Studies at Georgetown University. Again, thank you all for coming and welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. I won't be very long either. I would like to turn over the floor as quickly as possible. As my colleague uh, Gunul mentioned, my name is Sinan Ciddi. I'm the director of the Institute of Turkish Studies, which is based here. And once again, thank you for making the time to attend this very critical panel. Um, I should just like to say that this is a continuity of our collaborative effort between the Center for Turkish Studies at the Middle East Institute and the Institute of Turkish Studies based here. Dr. Tol or my colleague Gunnar and I have had a long and fruitful relationship of putting together um, what we think to be our very significant and worthwhile events to um, highlight some interesting developments within our immediate region, but specifically the country of Turkey. So today we do have what we think to be a very poignant um, uh, title uh, referring to, referred to as Turkey, ISIS and the Middle East. Um, it is a timely topic we think because of Turkey's proposed role for what is happening uh, in northern Syria and Iraq with the spread of the ISIS threat. I think some of the questions that we're going to explore uh, from the panel today will try and shed light on some of the most urgent questions that are being asked in the capitals of Europe, but more specifically the capital of the United States, Washington DC here. Uh, I think each person is very qualified to speak from a very different perspective, hence why we are very grateful for having them and for them for making their time. Um, what I will briefly do, uh, I think, is just briefly read uh, the, bio, the bio of each speaker as they come up to speak, as opposed to rattling them off all at, all at the same time. Um, First up, we are very privileged to once again host Dr. Denise Natalie, who holds the Minerva Chair at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, where she focuses on the political economy of Iraqi federalism and regional energy sector politics. Dr. Natalie has lived and researched extensively in the Kurdish regions of Iraq, Turkey, Iran, and Syria, and authored new, numerous publications on Kurdish politics, economy, and identity, including the Kurdish quasi-state. Uh, including the Kurdish quasi-state development and dependency in post-Gulf War Iraq, and the, Tur the Kurds and state, evolving national identity in Iraq, Turkey, and Iran. Each speaker will have approximately 12 minutes, after which time we will give you ample time uh, to address questions to the panel, uh, panels. Thank you very much. Dr. Natalie. Thank you. Thank you, Sinan. Thank you, Gunal. I'd like to thank um, the Middle East Institute and the Turkish Studies um, Association here at Georgetown. Just a disclaimer, anything I say is my own views and not that of the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, or the National Defense University. As we look at, what I, what I want to look at here, or, or what Gunal asked me to, to take a peek at is, what or how can we interpret some of these shifting alliances that are emerging from this ISIS um, insurgency, if you will, between Turkey, the Kurds in Iraq, and the PKK and the Syrian Kurds? Um, what has happened since the, as we call it, the takeover of Mosul on June 2014 has been a realigning, at least what it appears to be, a realigning of some of these rival Kurdish groups, such as the Kurdistan Regional Government and the PKK, and I say slash PYD, which is a Syrian arm of this group, um, into some type of Kurdish alliance to fight ISIS. 
Should we be concerned about this? Is this something significant that is going to challenge the Turkish relationship with the KRG? What does this mean in terms of regional stability? Is this going to enhance the PKK or the PYD's uh, influence in the region? I don't think so, and I'm actually pretty skeptical even about how far this so-called alliance, if you want to even call it that, between the KRG, the Kurdish the Kurds of Iraq and the PKK can go. But nonetheless, let's look at wh wh what has happened. What has happened even before June? Because it, it was something more subtle than just ISIS taking over Mosul. You have very strong Turkey-Kurdish-Iraqi relations that have evolved more significantly to, since 2008, grounded in energy sector relations, commercial ties, and security issues. One of the key components of this, and this was also a personal relationship. It was a Barzani President Erdogan tie and Barzani would be the envoy for Erdogan not only in checking the PKK but in subduing these Syrian Kurds pushing Barzani influence and it would help Barzani be the king of all the Kurds which is you know one of his dreams. Um, that was one part of it. Um, the other part of it was their Turkey PKK relations and Barzani was to be a playing a role as well in helping this, uh, this peace process which still seems to be stymied. And then the third part is the whole Kurdistan region, regional government, the KRG I'll call it, and the PKK. And as we all know, or some of us may know, these two trends have been at each other in certain forms between cooperation, tacit agreement, leaving the PKK in the Kandil Mountains in northern Iraq, and also in, in, in direct competition with each other. It, and that competition still exists today. That is to say, the two main nationalist trends within the Kurdish movement across all the borders are those led by Ojalan, Abdullah Ojalan and the PKK and Masoud Barzani. And the extent to which this competition for leadership of the Kurds and to direct the nature of the Kurdish nationalism should be taken into account, because that did not change after June 10th, 2014, and it continues today. So, when you're looking at the changing relationships, uh, look at this as well as when it's these internal power struggles between the Kurds, they are existing today. Because the Kurdistan regional government does need to be broken down into Barzani's Kurdistan Democratic Party and the Taliban Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. They are very divided today. And each one of them are trying to play off each other between Turkey, Iran, and the PKK. So what has happened? What did the onslaught of, of the Islamic State do for the Kurds? It created a shared existential threat to this idea of a Kurdish nation to the idea of Kurdish nationalism. So that Ojalan now is declaring, uh, calling all the Kurds to go fight ISIS. And when the Islamic State came into Mosul and the Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga under Barzani fled, who came and saved the day? It was the PYD and the PKK. And sim even symbolically, this has played very well into the PKK's hands. Uh, particularly among the Yazidis who are now blaming the Barzanis and the KDP for running away and it's the PKK considered the savior who is now in Mount Sinjar who effectively continued to fight. So this whole image of the PKK coming into northern Iraq and the Kurdistan region remains in the minds of many Kurds today and that, uh, that is something that has changed. Secondly, even if you look at some of the discourse of what's going on between these parties, they're actually competing for each other, competing against each other regarding who is making claims to saving more people. They're not, this is not a strategic alliance. It's a tactical one. So that the PKK is taking advantage of these splits and fighting alongside the PUK, but not necessarily the KDP. Each one continues to vie for the support of Kurdish populations in the hope be either Barzani's group or Ojalan's group, of gaining influence. That has not changed. But again, the PKK has capitalized on this, moment, on this movement. What else has not changed? The Kurdistan region, the Barzani-Turkey alliance. Now you've heard, um, I don't know why, the, the Iraqi Kurds, some of them are disappointed with Turkey for not having come to the Iraqi Kurds' defense militarily. Um, you know, nonetheless, the Kurdistan regional government doesn't have much choice here. That alliance with Turkey remains essential, 
not only commercially but politically. So some of those same limitations that existed before the Mosul intervention continues today. And I don't think that Barzani is going to sacrifice his relationship with, with President Erdogan uh, for the PKK. That goes in terms of energy interests. That goes in the survivability of the Kurds' quasi-state. There's also a limitation, again, between even if some of the Kurds and the PKK are coordinating and they're fighting with the Iraqi Kurds, um, there's still an influence, again, of this power struggle. Barzani still wants to influence the Syrian Kurds, and any alliance that Barzani maintains with Turkey is going to work against him, particularly since yesterday, when there was a successful release of the Turkish hostages. How are the Kurds in Syria interpreting this? Erdogan cut a deal with ISIS, and that's why they came into Gobani. And Barzani's indirectly implement, impl implicated as long as he's, he's got this alliance with Turkey. So again, in the, in the minds of Kurds on the ground, as long as this Kurdish problem in Turkey is not resolved, it's, and as long as Barzani's in the heart of, of the Turkish alliance, there really are important limitations between these two, these two groups. And I, and, I, and I see that that's going to stay. And finally, um, there are deep internal power struggles going on inside the Kurdistan region right now. They existed before, but since the ISIL, you had the PUK working, and, and the Iranians have provided necessary weapons to the Kurds. Both, both have agreed. Barzani thanked the Iranians, but nonetheless, you have that, that division. And I don't want to make it so clean cut, but it was the Barzani, Turkey division, and then the PUK, PYD, PKK, and Iran division. And that, that is playing off of each other. So this intervention is giving these groups the opportunities certainly to come together in this authenticating Kurdish nationalism, but it's also reinforcing some of those divisions that are going to keep, in my view, keep these groups apart, at least strategically, but on a tactical level to use each other, particularly as the Americans engage and the coalition engages to assist Iraqi Kurds uh, in providing weapons and military assistance. I think I'm going to close there. So again, uh, think of this alliance. Don't be worried. I don't, I don't think that there's, you know, people were worrying there's going to be an independent Kurdistan last month, um, and that wasn't going to happen. This is, this is not a strategic alliance. It cannot be sustained as long as Iraqi Kurds need regional support and as long as regional states reinforce their commitment to the territorial boundaries of Iraq, which I don't see changing any time in the near or long term. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this, uh, Dr. Natalie. Next up, we have Dr. Uh, Kadir Ustun, who is the research director at the SETA Foundation at Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Usin also serves as Assistant Editor of Insight Turkey, an academic journal published by the SETA Foundation. Dr. Usin holds a PhD in Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies from Columbia University and a Master's Degree in History from Bilkent University. Dr. Usin has taught courses in History, Politics, Culture and Art in the Islamic World as well as Western Political Thought at Columbia University and George Mason University. His research interests include civil military relations, social and military modernization in the Middle East, U.S. Turkey relations and Turkish foreign policy. Dr. Ustin, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Institute of Turkish Studies and Middle East Institute, Sinan and Gönül. Thank you very much for reminding me here. Uh, I was asked to talk about ISIS, how I, well, Turkey, Turkey's ISIS policy, how Turkey approaches this challenge. Um, in many, in some ways, the answer is is very simple. Um, Turkey considers ISIS a terrorist organization, and that is that. But um, when you look at the broader context and how we got here, uh, both in terms of the challenges, uh, the civil war in Syria, and the Iraqi situation over the past several years, Iraqi political situation, uh, things get much fuzzier. How to resolve this problem, that, that question becomes a much more difficult one. And just right off the bat, I can say that the current campaign is not clear about this 
either. There's no actual political goal, political strategy defined, at least what we can see publicly by the U.S., that, that will resolve the issues on the ground and then lead to a stable situation in Syria or Iraq. Um, how we got here? How we got, how we've come here is, is very quickly the, the so-called Arab Spring, Arab revolutions, and then counter-revolution, and then civil war. And actually aspects of all these three are right now at play in both Syria and uh, Iraq. Um, the, the U.S. and the allies, including Turkey, have failed to find a common strategy, common front, uh, to support the Syrian opposition and create a credible alternative to Assad regime. And the chaos and vacuum created by the civil war over the past several years have uh, created breeding ground for uh, terrorist organizations. Assad regime is culpable in all this as well. Um, they've used divide and rule tactics against the opposition. Um, they've kind of allowed Kurds in the north to have their own space. Uh, you don't touch me, I don't touch you kind of arrangement. And um, Kurds focused on protecting their own territory. Um, and the, the the regime is culpable in, in also allowing ISIS to, to have, have space for itself. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but the, the dynamics on the ground, maybe two years ago, a year and a half ago, you could still talk about the regime versus opposition dynamic, but today that's not there. And because the international community hasn't been able to take care of this, not that the, inter the U.S. and allies could possibly put everything back to normal. Or that, that's not possible. That wasn't probably going to be possible. But uh, we've missed many opportunities to prevent the events that have unfolded over the past year, year and a half. Um, the vacuum created um, in, in the Syrian civil war is eclipsed by another vacuum next door in Iraq. The alienation and disenchantment of the Sunni uh, populations and the Maliki government's exclusive, uh, exclusionary uh, policies toward that population has created ample opportunity for ISIL to capitalize on. Uh, a lot of political discontent and disenchantment uh, is underlying, um, is very um, strong now and in, in, has been strong for a while in Iraq. So that has uh, basically created a situation where in the north you have the Kurds there, as, as Dr. Natali mentioned, uh, a month ago or a couple months ago they were talking about they might declare independence. And then Baghdad government, who is kind of supporting Assad regime and uh, sort of conducting um, sectarian policies against the Sunnis and then aligning with Iran and trying to play off Iran against U.S. and then Russia, etc. So you have, uh, in both countries, uh, we have almost... Uh, unannounced, you know, failed states in many ways. Um, so how are we going to put all this to, back together? Uh, I don't think it, we are going to put it all back together by striking ISIS. That's, that's a counterterrorism measure, and it's going to help uh, roll back ISIL, perhaps militarily. Uh, it might create some semblance of... Uh, Security. I'm, I'm even scared to suggest that uh, because the situation is so uh, so complicated. But uh, those kind of gains would have to be translated into political uh, stability, which won't happen unless you can address the Syrian civil war and the Iraqi Sunni disenchantment, among many other political challenges. But we do need a political roadmap. Um, 
the, at the current attacks act, actually might lead to sort of emergence of splintered groups. It might even increase, you know, internal cohesion of, of ISIL and their broad appeal abroad. So there are lots of unforeseen circumstances that can come up. Um, the, the, unfortunately, the, the current Obama, President Obama's strategy, announced strategy, does not seem to address, the, from my point of view, the political a, um, aspects of this issue. Um, in, in Syria, there has to be a broader political plan for a transitional government. Um, and, I mean, after all, Assad regime's refusal to lead the country into, a, into unity, into a sort of somewhat stable situation, is at the heart of, at the uh, root cause of ISIL's strength in, in Syria. Uh, and similarly, there has to be a plan to address the Sunni um, discontent in, in Iraq. Iraq. Iraqi government has pledged to be inclusive in the near term. Uh, there could be an opportunity now Maliki is out, but there's going to be a long way to go because Sunnis, are, they've done this before. They've done the awakening, and I'm not sure how much they're going to trust the Baghdad government after all this. Um, what is Turkey's approach? Um, Turkey has been affected by uh, both situations in significant ways. Uh, you can talk about perhaps marginal gains, like they've, they were able to deepen the ties with KRG, um, but broadly I think both Syria's and Iraq's stability and those countries remaining united is in the best interest of Turkey in the medium term and long term. Um, the, Turkey has been affected uh, in terms of security, uh, fall, uh, security fallout from the Syrian crisis. Uh, it has been affected, it is hosting now a million and a half refugees. Uh, there are more coming. Um, and, and among many other, uh, Turkey has supported the uh, opposition in Syria and it has called for the end of the Syrian regime as it is now. It has uh, asked the U.S. to create no-fly zone. It has asked, you know, it was ready to co uh, work with Obama when, when Assad crossed the red line, etc. So Turkey has been asking the international community, or the U.S. and the allies, to, to actually contain the civil war and help build a coalition to lead towards a transitional government, political transition in Syria. And that hasn't happened, and it probably won't happen anytime soon. But that's the harder task uh, that we have to accomplish. That's harder than, uh, you know, um, bombing and then thinking about it later. In a couple months, there's this I don't want to create another, you know, name for this, but maybe bomb and walk away syndrome, something like that. If we see that happening, uh, we won't see any stability, semblance of stability in the Middle East anytime soon. Um, Al Qaeda activities inside Syria, inside Turkey, uh, and across the border is a serious concern for Turkey as well, and. It, it has struggled to keep the border secure. Uh, it's very hard when you're also supporting uh, the opposition groups. Um, and the, while trying to secure the border, you're trying to take care of the refugee problem, but you're also involved in trying to uh, find a way to, you know, convince groups like Kurds and others to to unite as a, around a common front against the Assad regime, which Turkey sees at the at the core of uh, at the heart of uh, the the current instability. I don't want to run out 
of my time. Um, the very recently Turkey talked again about the no-fly zone idea, and that would have to be endorsed by the UN Security Council. I don't see it happening uh, anytime soon, and the U.S. won't be willing to do it on its own, obviously. And Turkey doesn't quite have the capacity. It can support an effort like that, but it can't do it on its own. Um, so Turkey's legislation allows it to, they passed the legislation months ago to do conduct cross-border operations in, in Syria and Iraq. And just the other day, they broadened the uh, purview of that legislation. So um, we might see sort of um, Turkey taking part uh, in a larger capacity in the current, after the release of the hostages, we can see maybe Turkey taking a strong, uh, larger role, um, even military or otherwise. But I think. Uh, Turkey will maintain a defensive posture for the time being. Uh, and unless they see a plan, uh, as I talked about, a broader, long, longer-term plan in Syria, uh, I don't think they'll, they'll be part of a military operation. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr chance to ask a lot more questions to all the panelists at the end of uh, each speaker's time. And for the present time, the last speaker we have is Mutlu Civiroğlu, who is a Washington-based uh, journalist and Kurdish affairs analyst focusing on Syria and Turkey. He has closely been monitoring the Kurdish People's Protection Union, the, the YPG, against ISIS and other jihadist groups. His publications appear in various media outlets, including the BBC, CNN, Vice, and Al Jazeera. He regularly writes for Turkish Daily Radical and on recent developments from the Rojava region in Syria. Shivirol is frequently interviewed by TV channels in Turkey, Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, as well as many other ch channels in t Turkey and Syria as well. Uh, Mutlu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sinan, for this uh, event. Thank you, Gunnar, for you too. Uh, I will, uh, for, uh, hello, uh, welcome all of you. I'll try to, I, before I just entered here, I got some call from within Syria, uh, some uh, drawing the, the dire uh, situation that in Kobani, I would like to start with that. Uh, the U.S. airstrikes in Syria, uh, Kurds uh, welcomed them positively, but unfortunately so far uh, there, has no, there hasn't been any uh, positive impact on the situation of Kobani. Uh, I'm not sure if how much you're familiar with the situation. Kobani is a, one of the three Kurdish enclaves in Syria, uh, uh, what we call like Rojava. Uh, it has been under uh, fierce ISIS attacks uh, for over a week now. The ISIS, with all power, well, all U.S. weapons uh, they seized from Mosul, now has been uh, attacking uh, Kobani, uh, Ain al-Arab, the official name, to seize the city. And there are serious fears that of, uh, local officials uh, are very, very concerned that they are planning to do a, a manslaughtering, like massacre, even a larger scale uh, than ha what happened in Sinjar. So uh, what the people I spoke today uh, are telling me, both politi political and military uh, people are telling me that uh, ISIS uh, predicted these attacks are coming. So they moved uh, most of their manpower out of Raqqa where it's being targeted right now. So uh, what is being targeted at the moment are buildings, concrete buildings, uh, really uh, not damaging a lot, uh, underground-wise, practical-wise. So the, the, positive, the negative impact for Kurds is that the, all those fighters uh, left uh, Raqqa are moving towards uh, Kobani. So the pressure over the city has increased uh, after these attacks. So this, this uh, increases the, uh, the possibility of a uh, city falling into ISIS or massacre take place even, even uh, more. So this is uh, one of the things that uh, I need to share with you. Uh, the, the demand from the local officials is that uh, if U.S. is really willing to uh, uh, degrade and destroy ISIS, uh, they should uh, focus on some targets around Kobani too, because the city is right now being attacked from three uh, directions, uh, west, east, and south. The north is Turkey, the Turkish border. So all three possible uh, directions, 
the city is under attack. Despite the fact that Kurds have been uh, fighting, resisting with very, very uh, modest weapons, which are not matched to ISIS's uh, weapons, uh, but the situation is getting worse. ISIS has been uh, using uh, Humvees, uh, sophisticated tanks, whereas the Kurds have uh, Kalashnikovs and RPGs that are not matched. So what's happening is right now in the uh, last two days, uh, Kurds have been uh, resorting to, uh, uh, fighters have been resorting to use their bodies to stop the tanks, so to explode uh, the, these tanks because they don't have weapons. So uh, this is the, what happened on the ground. Unless uh, ISIS targets around Kobani is targeted, uh, it's likely that uh, a very serious massacre uh, might take place in, uh, uh, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, maybe in two days. This is the, what I have taught, exactly their own words, the people. So I hope that uh, President Obama, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the CENTCOM who are planning this operation, take this into consideration and urgently address this issue. I interviewed uh, Mr. Salih Muslim, uh, Democratic Union Party PYD's uh, leader uh, yesterday about, to get his reaction about the attacks. He, he says it's very positive, but Kurds, uh, as the main power fighting ISIS uh, for over uh, one and a half years, almost two years, so they are the most uh, experienced uh, power that know ISIS techniques, ISIS uh, uh, better experience. So they, he says they want to be a partner uh, within this operation if uh, really the, the, the purpose is uh, destroying ISIS. So the expectation among the Kurds in Syria is that the, in uh, immediate uh, term, ISIS uh, targets around Kobani will be attacked, mm -hmm. and in uh, upcoming days, uh, the underground aspect of the operation, the, uh, fighting with ISIS, will uh, include Kurds, especially the YPG, YPG. Uh, like, and now everybody agrees is, uh, that is the most effective uh, force fighting the ISIS. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, at the moment I can tell you in regards to uh, what uh, Kurds of uh, Turkey, how uh, Turkey, Turkey's role from the Kurdish Syrian perspective and from Kur uh, Kurds of Turkey's perspective, there is a growing uh, uh, disappointment towards Turkey within uh, the Syrian Kurdish population and within population in uh, Turkey as well. Uh, this is being raised in the very the highest level uh, by the, uh, various Kurdish uh, uh, representatives, politicians, or military uh, people. Uh, that uh, so far the, uh, I, the general perception was that Turkey is uh, turning blind eye to ISIS, so uh, indirectly allowing jihadists to pour into Syria uh, to support uh, treat uh, jihadists in, in Syrian hospitals. But uh, with the recent attacks, this perception has even uh, changed. That now. Many people think Turkey took this uh, support one step further, no, no longer turning blind eye, and really uh, helping ISIS. This is the perception is uh, among the Syrian Kurds. It's being uh, raised by many people uh, in uh, Kurds, among the Kurds of Syria, uh, Turkey too. Uh, HDP HDP uh, parliamentarians have been raising this uh, two days ago. Murat Karel and one of the leading uh, PKK uh, members. Uh, he also mentioned that uh, uh, we were stabbed from the back, uh, referring to uh, the government, that uh, uh, government chose to support ISIS instead of the Kurds who are hoping, uh, who, ha who have invested their hopes in the peace process. So right now, uh, the, the future of peace process is in, is in uh, vain. There are serious concerns that the peace process is not, may not uh, really uh, continue. Uh, in Kurdish uh, point of view now, uh, many people are uh, looking forward to hear what Öcalan to say about this. But uh, I talked to Mr. Demirtas, Salatin Demirtas, HDP's uh, leader, he's here in Washington right now. I had the opportunity to talk to him uh, today. Uh, uh, I think the situation of Kobani, the, the dire situation of Kobani, uh, is taking an important uh, place in his agenda with the U.S. officials and uh, the other organizations. So, uh, uh, although uh, some Turkish media reports something from him, I asked him, but he said he didn't, he has not said one week, supposedly he had given one week to government to clarify, but uh, he's going to uh, do some statement tomorrow, but he is uh, also uh, shared that they are not happy, they are very, they're, uh, certainly very uh, disappointed the way government handles the issue of ISIS uh, versus Syrian Kurds. So this is, uh, this is uh, uh, growing uh, discontent towards uh, Turkey. Uh, as far as uh, 
the, what is uh, on the ground uh, concerned, like recently uh, YPG and the Free Syrian Army had some kind of uh, agreement uh, on the ground and there are right now some groups of FSA are fighting alongside uh, YPG against ISIS uh, around the Euphrates uh, River. This is maybe uh, worth, uh, not, uh, not worthy. So, uh, in regards to for, uh, freeing 49 uh, hostages, among the Kurds, the perception is that there was a real deal, that there was a deal that has been uh, done between the government, Turkish government, and the, the uh, ISIS. The deal is that uh, there are some uh, uh, like ideas or uh, allegations that uh, Turkish officials provided a train load of uh, weaponry before this attack happened. So uh, I talked to Mr. Enver Muslim. He is the uh, head of the local uh, Koban account, on what they call it, the, the local government. He was saying that uh, there are videos, and I think uh, this video is now also uh, published in CNN's site, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So there are videos that the Turkish uh, train stops somewhere in the middle of the uh, border and gives uh, weapons to uh, ISIS-controlled village. So of course, these, these, are, these are very seriously being raised by the highest uh, officials, both in the Tur Turkish and the Syrian side of the border from the Kurdish uh, officials, they are uh, very concerned that uh, this is a situation. I can tell you that uh, there is a big uh, fear, there's a big concern, and what personally uh, creates a concern for me is that the, the peace process, the, uh, s uh, the status of uh, non-clash, uh, this can be uh, come to an end, this can be jeopardized. This is, a, as, a, a, as an individual, a big, great concern for me. So uh, hopefully this, uh, this, uh, this crisis situation will be uh, addressed effectively. And uh, the way to do that is that uh, talking to Kurds, uh, listening to them, uh, what they have to say, uh, Kurds, uh, not only in Syria, but also in Iraq, they have, the Kurds have been the, the main power fighting ISIS, not only in Syria, but in, in, in Iraq, to from Afrin, all the way, uh, 75 kilometers to Mediterranean Sea, all the way, uh, Kanakin, it's all Kurds are fighting with I, uh, ISIS. Although the Kurds of Iraq, like Dennis also mentioned, they get some acknowledgement and get support uh, from international community in regards to uh, weapon, and in regards to recognition, but Kurds of Syria, who are the main power of uh, fighting, weakening, not allowing ISIS to expand, they are uh, the main power, and uh, this needs to be uh, acknowledged and this uh, needs to be seen. So had it not been for the, the YPG, the uh, community is living in north of Syria, Kurds, Arabs, uh, Armenians, Syriacs, they, they would have been much more, uh, worse situation. But thanks to the stabi relative stability that provided, uh, thanks to YPG, now those communities are living in a uh, comparatively better situation than the rest of Syria. So this has to be seen. Uh, the, the expectation on the ground is that uh, U.S. and the partners will see that and uh, will acknowledge, will provide them a weapon in the, uh, immediately and protect the people of Kobana. I want to emphasize this one more time. The people of Kobana, some hundred thousand of people are under great, great danger. Uh, everyone knows ISIS does not hesitate to use a any means. So uh, world uh, shed tears for uh, Yazidi Kurds. Uh, as you know, Yazidis are also a curse. So, uh, but another Sinjar uh, event very likely to happen. So it is the it is the, the duty of international community to see this and to uh, address this concern. Am I? Time. Okay, so this is, I would like to conclude here. Uh, I'm sure in the Q&A section, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad. So thank you. Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions and answers, but if I may, what I'm going to do is um, just start the ball rolling by uh, asking each of the panelists uh, one targeted question each, and if they would also like to address one another's um, uh, pieces, that would also be appropriate too. And then what we will have is we have two microphones on each side of the aisle, so if you would like to ask a question um, after, I've, uh, after the panelists have done answering their initial questions, what you can do is basically raise your hand, and if you could please introduce yourself briefly and ask um, uh, a question with uh, the minimum amount of comments so as to allow everyone in the room uh, as, as much questions that, uh, as, as we can field. But um, if I may, um, I'd like to start with Dr. Natalie, um, and 
I'd like to thank all the four panelists for, um, for their very interesting and insightful comments. Um, we, we know that recently the Congress has passed a, a spending bill which will allow a certain amount of um, money to be targeted to armed what has been referred to um, the moderate opposition uh, to fight ISIS. What is assumed uh, by the U.S. government in your interpretation of, of the term moderate? What, what do we understand by this? Um, and, um, and, and related to that, I guess this is a broader question, what is expected of the United, by the United States um, of Turkey uh, in the continuity of this um, this, 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 this campaign. Uh, Kadir, uh, my question um, to you now that the 49 or 46, I, I'm getting confused with the number of hostages released. Um, so it's 49 in total. I've, I've seen conflicting figures. But, um, but anyhow, uh, the 49 hostages that are now being freed, um, there is a growing expectation uh, on, some, on, on some level that Turkey should now be playing um, a greater role in the, in, in the coalition that has been built against ISIS. Um, what are the factors that constrain or are likely to constrain or, con or facilitate Turkey's um, f role in the combat against ISIS? I mean, what is the Turkish government's position, do you think, um, in terms of now uh, uh, branching out uh, against ISIS? Um, and finally, uh, Mutlu, my question goes to you. Um, well, it, it's two parts, and one, it, it, they're kind of unrelated. It is assumed that, on some level, that airstrikes uh, may have a limited impact uh, against ISIS. Um, is there any indication, uh, from what you've heard from your contacts and your interviews, that boots on the ground, in any sort of capacity, may be considered, and at what point, um, if airstrikes are seen to be ineffective uh, at the end? Um, and what is the expectation of Syrian Kurds, uh, of Turkey? Um, given what you've said. So I, I would think uh, three or four minutes each per panelist, and then we will have plenty of time for questions from, from the floor. Thank you. Can, can we answer? Can answer you can answer. Yeah, I think you can answer from, yeah, thank from where you, you're sitting. Sinan. Um, so I, again, I am, I'm speaking on my own behalf here. Um, what does the Congress mean when we talk about a moderate opposition? You know, this was one of the problems. This is not the first time we're visiting the Syrian uh, crisis, and this happened a couple of years ago or a year ago. Should we, you know, uh, should we fund and train a Syrian opposition? What does it mean? Al Nusra moving back and forth from the FSA, Free Syrian Army, moving back again between ISIS. So it's been very difficult to target what would be a moderate opposition. Nonetheless, there is the term you probably heard vetted, right? There will be a vetted opposition in the sense that arms aren't just going to go willy nilly to anybody, you know, with their hands out. That there would be those moderate groups vetted within and, you know, coordinated with the Syrian National Coalition, which is the group that the United States recognizes as, as, as one official, as the official group or official group, opposition group in Syria. So who are those names? I don't know. But this is not a perfect situation. Actually, they're all only bad choices. So you have to pick you know, what I see as the least bad choice. Um, and there is awareness that one of the big concerns is, will these weapons being provided to a vetted, moderate opposition fall in the hands of unsavory types, right? It, will they make their way to ISIS? I mean, just months ago, you, you, you probably couldn't even tell who was with ISIS and who was without, with, not in ISIS. Will they be used against Assad? Because there's a different mission in Syria for ISIS than there is those members of ISIS than there is in Iraq, which is one of them is still overthrowing the Assad regime. So that's a concern. There's another anomaly. The very group, as Mutlu indicated, that has been fighting Islamic State since day one, which is the PYD, is obviously not on uh, a list in which the United States could fund or, or, uh, or support. And, and, and here I go to whatever policy that is provided, don't forget the underlying principles of U.S. policy to support the terror, ensure the territorial integrity of these states. Turkey remains a key, essential ally. So what do we expect of Turkey? Certainly there's been a lot of attention to Turkey should be doing more, close the borders, we've heard the story, and, and there is a lot of you know, credibility to that. But since these hostages have been released, you've already seen, uh, I would say, efforts being made at the border to capture the smugglers of oil. There's a large and significant revenue stream 
being used to support the ISIS in Iraq and Syria, and I think some of these efforts are starting to be made on the Turkish side. Secondly, I don't imagine that every coalition partner, and that doesn't include Turkey, it also includes our partners in the Gulf, are not going to be participating exactly the same. Uh, that does not mean that Turkey will not be engaged and will not continue to play uh, an important role. So um, there has been, again, it should be more nuanced. I don't see how any of this could happen without Turkey. Uh, and whether we want to say that er Erdogan has turned a blind eye or now he's complicit in it, I think we will likely see a turning and, and more engagement. But in the way that Turkey can, my last point is we're far from the region. Those of you who have lived in a region for the, a really long time know that we can leave. But Turkey and all of the other players, they've got to deal with these actors on their borders for a long time ahead. So that's where I, where, where I leave my answer. Thank you. Well, that answers, <laughs> that gives the it's part of my answer too. Um, the, the, that border is a long border. Uh, it's a flat land. It's very easy to move in and out. Um, Turkey has a highly centralized, strong government, and it, its internal security is strong. It has traditionally strong. But it doesn't mean that it can protect the border. Uh, just think of the Mexican border. Um, but that, creates a lot, that has created a lot of problems for Turkey. At some point, if you look in the news reports, this was a long time, maybe a year, a year and a half ago, there was a band of smugglers in their horses with their arms and everything, they were going through the border and the Turkish military had to intervene. The, the problem is not easily uh, solvable in that way to, in terms of securing that border. Turkey has been doing a lot more, but uh, will it be ever enough? Uh, all sorts of groups will take advantage of that. Um, PKK has taken advantage of it for decades. Um, uh, but I don't see the strategic gain that Turkey would, would get from supporting ISIS. They adamantly deny having ever supported ISIS. It's a terrorist organization since 2013. And it's enlisted in the terror list in Turkey, etc. But even if they didn't decline, what is the strategic value uh, for Turkey to support ISIS, whereas on the other hand, those who fight ISIS are much more familiar to Turkey, actually. The Kurdish, I mean, the PKK and PYD, these are, these are guys Turkey knows, uh, long, no, has known for a long time. Uh, if you were Turkey, would you rather cooperate with them, work with them, or, or that you're at the table negotiating with them on, uh, for the resolution of the Kurdish issue at home? Or would you go ahead and support ISIS for what strategic benefit exactly? It's not clear to me. And if you're talking about the arms, ISIS has U.S. arms. Uh, does, that make, does that mean that U.S. gave our ISIS arms? Uh, so it's, let's, let's be more nuanced about that as well. There have, been, there have been many reports of uh, arms smuggling through Turkey into, into, the, uh, into Syria. But what I know from Turkey's perspective, the groups that are willing to unite and fight against the Assad regime will be, kind of, will be supported. Um, that's the kind of uh, line for Turkey. Are you going to be engaging in terrorist activity and holding ground for yourself, holding space for yourself, or are you going to go ahead and work to bring down this regime? You may like or not, Turkey remains committed to the regime change idea, which the U.S. technically also uh, is, is committed to, uh, and it is doing what is necessary to, to realize that. Of course, that may not be possible at this point, or it may not be possible anytime soon, but from that perspective, you don't have a serious reason to, to support ISIS unless you're thinking that Turkey is going to want Kurds being killed just because they're Kurds. 
And I don't think that's Turkey's perspective uh, with regards to, to Syria. Um, in terms of, you mentioned that actually vetting process the, the opposition, who, who to trust, etc. But that can all collapse if you don't support the opposition in, in, in other areas, you know, politically, if you don't allow them to manage uh, the humanitarian crisis, you're not going to get them, they're not going to be liked by the population. The, the population will have to succumb to the groups who are able to provide help to them. So if you can vet and arm the Syrian opposition, that's going to be only the beginning of the story. You're, you have to support it politically, diplomatically, financially, etc., and make it a credible alternative to Assad regime. I think Turkey and U.S. are on the same page uh, about that need, but the current strategy uh, does not seem to include that. So I think, uh, and it can all collapse. You can vet and arm a group, and then they can lose. Um, so. You, you, we need a medium and longer term strategy. Thanks. Okay. I would like to start with the second question, just to continue with what Kadir says. Okay. Uh, I agree with, uh, with him that the border of Turkey with Syria is pretty hard to control. It's 910 kilometers. It's very, very uh, hard to control. But I think uh, Turkey could have done much better in terms of uh, controlling uh, the jihadists pouring into Syria. Because most of these people have came to Istanbul legally, their passports carry you know, visas, the stamps. So, and this has been documented. The international media also covered how easily these people uh, traveled to Turkey. So, it's really uh, much more could have been done to prevent these people uh, all coming all over uh, the world, from even from China. Recently, there are reports that Chinese ISIS members were killed. They're, they're Uyghur, ethnic Uyghurs, so they're traveling from China, Afghanistan, uh, Tunisia, all over the world, uh, uh, Albania. So it's, there is no way these people are coming in an in, in illegal way. They're flying into Turkey. So this is, this is the, the first. The second thing, uh, Kadir brought a very nice point. Why would uh, Turkey uh, choose ISIS over uh, PYD? This is, a, this, is what, uh, this is the question what uh, Syrian Kurds have been asking actually for a long time. How come uh, Turkey uh, chooses ISIS over us. The, the perception, again, whoever you speak in Syrian Kurds, they're, they're uh, really uh, convinced that Turkey is uh, against, them. Turkey is not supporting them, Turkey is supporting these groups that's fighting against them. So, uh, I don't know why. Maybe the phobia, the Kurdish phobia is still alive. Uh, maybe, I have no idea. But I uh, would also ask the same question. I would assume uh, Turkey uh, should support Kurds. Uh, because Turkey has a large uh, Kurdish population and the Syrian Kurds are direct relatives of Kurds from Turkey. I have, my, I have some relatives in, you know, end up being in Syria, so uh, I have my own relatives. So really, uh, in Kurdish uh, perspective, the, the, although I am Turkish officially and my relatives are Syrian, but we still consider ourselves, you know, relatives, one family. So the, uh, the, the expectation from the very beginning was both uh, the PYD and the other side, Syrian National Council, uh, SKNC, that they had uh, good relations with Turkey, but uh, this is not the case. Unfortunately, uh, the, the, the Syrian uh, Kurdish region are under embargo. The, 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 the Turkish uh, borders are very, very, uh, there is very limited passage. So only a very, very uh, emergency case, uh, humanitarian aid that the BDP municipalities are sending are allowed. Other than that, it's close to uh, trades. People, uh, people are suffering as all Syrians are suffering, Kurds are suffering too, because uh, there is no goods coming into Syria and the Syrian uh, uh, Kurdish region. And Turkey could have really uh, allowed that, have eased the, the, the embargo by uh, allowing people uh, to go back and forth to allow trades, the Turkish companies could have made lots of money. So uh, I'm saying this based on my, because I, I talk to Sy Kurdish Syria daily. I interview, I write. So this, what, this is what they say. For example, Afrin is a city, uh, is a town actually of Halep, but it's really a city, huge city now. The population even doubled, tripled after the, the internal, uh, the uh, arrival of internal people, IDPs. Uh, people over there say, we are close to Gaziantep. It's an uh, economical, industrial hub. We want Turkish companies to come here, 
rather than we pay uh, 200, 300 percent commission to the mediators, we want Turkish companies to come and uh, do business here. We want to have good relationship. We want, we have money, but we cannot spend. So we would love to see that. So there were uh, really uh, many possibilities that Turkey could improve the relations, but this did not happen. Turkey first uh, acted like there are no Kurds in Syria. This was a Turkish policy. Later on, uh, Turkey acted like there's only Syrian Kurdish National Council. It's another uh, Kurdish group. But there is, uh, there is uh, mentioned a little bit that the group Barzani, Mr. Barzani, has been supporting, uh, which uh, pretty marginalized uh, recently. Uh, then uh, it didn't work all, uh, as well. Then Turkey uh, tried to act, uh, seem like acknowledging uh, PYD by uh, inviting Mr. Salih Muslim, but the relations uh, stayed there. Unfortunately, did not uh, uh, improve. So. Uh, maybe one reason uh, the, uh, many people believe is that Turkey uh, makes uh, Turkey benefits from uh, making ISIS and uh, YPG fight. So getting rid of uh, two evils with one stone. I think uh, this is many people believe that. So let them fight. But even though this is the case, still favoring ISIS. So this is you can you can uh, read the international media. They are now in uh, uh, Suruç, the town across Kobani in the Turkish part of the border. So. Uh, look, the Reuters report, BBC report, they all say that the, whoever is interviewed, they are, they are very convinced that Turkey is really uh, in this war against them. So uh, this, is, this needs to be seen. This is not without any ground. Uh, I think uh, what has been done so far accumulated and made people to bring that uh, Turkey is uh, running out, carrying out a negative uh, policy towards them. In regards to airstrikes impact, like I said, the, the, the target of airstrikes are not the Kurdish uh, regions, not the Kurdish towns, especially not Kobane, which is, has a very critical situation. It's Raqqa, Idlib, uh, this kind of places. So because it's not directly where Kurds are fighting with ISIS, it doesn't have any impact. So if the targets around Kobane, idle Arab, are hit, this might slow down the ISIS advance. This might you know, give some opportunity, maybe destroy their weapons, the high sophisticated, highly sophisticated weapons. This might give some uh, room for uh, better protecting themselves for the YPG. But this is not happening. So the impact is only in moral aspect. That, oh, OK, ISIS, uh, maybe ISIS feel more pressure, under pressure, that attacks are coming. And the fighters on the ground might feel more uh, high morale that ISIS is being attacked, and now uh, maybe uh, very likely the targets, the people, positions that ISIS attacking are also going to be targeted. So this is the impact. And, and people, the IDPs, refugees in Turkey, they are uh, starting to return, hoping that the situation is going to normalize with the attacks. But militarily, there is no uh, positive impact, rather negative, because ISIS uh, sending all the uh, fighters, those who are not sent already, the ones uh, in the city of Raqqa and other places, sending towards uh, Kobane, at least to get that and make it uh, a prestige issue for itself. Okay. You just wanted to chime in briefly. Very quickly. Um, for, uh, Turkey has, has, been in, has been talking to, uh, to Europe for more than a year now, and Tur Europeans said you shouldn't allow these foreign fighters to come in, and Turkey asked them for lists. And when they provided the lists, Turkey deported a lot of people, more than 1,000 people. Which is a great step. Uh, but uh, if, you're, if you're a European, if you have a European passport and you have a beard or whatever, you come to the airport, are we to assume that you're going to join ISIS and stop you? So that's a, that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, but Turkey hasn't refused to deport people. It has uh, deported a lot of people. Um, and PYD is still technically a terrorist organization for Turkey. So you're saying that Turkey needs to cross the border into Syria, risk getting into war with Assad regime, basically, right? It has the authority to do conduct cross-border operations for its own security. But you're saying that Turkey should come in and help PYD, which is an arm of PKK, which is technically a, still a terrorist organization, and save the Kurds from ISIS, this doesn't quite work that way. The ISIS is a terrorist organization for Turkey, and PYD is, is similar. So you're asking Turkey to go into a different country uh, and basically um, 
help the Kurds. Helping the Kurds on the humanitarian side is a priority for Turkey. Turkey hasn't closed the borders. It's taken uh, more than 130,000 refugees. More are coming. But the helping Turkey, helping Kurds in what way exactly? It's not clear. So you're saying Turkish army should come in and help PYD yeah, defeat yeah, ISIS? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to make this too long. But also, uh, um, in terms of the embargo, again, it's the same thing. It's a PYD-controlled area. How, how do you expect Turkish businesses to do trade with what, they, what is considered a terrorist organization in Turkey? Can I just jump in? Yeah. yeah. Box, but it's just, honest, then we'll open it up to the floor. Can, can I just make a couple of comments to try to mediate? Um, what, we, we said, you know, there's a statement made, well, naturally Turkey should be working with the P PKK, PYD, because they know them. My argument would be that's exactly right. It's because Turkey knows the PYD and PKK that they have no interest in seeing this group armed. And, we, and secondly, um, we need to look at this as an evolving policy. I hardly think, and I have initially been critical of this what seemed to be open door, open border policy. But you know what was perceived as Al Nusra the Free Syrian Army. You know, this all evolved over time, so I hardly think that Turkey or anybody else in the Syrian coalition that was starting this in Istanbul two years ago said, boy, let's bring them in because we know they're going to be ISIS. Even six months ago, you didn't imagine that this was going to turn out the way that it is. There's 100,000 refugees in Istanbul. There's sleeper cells in Istanbul. This is not just about the border now. This is in the heart of Turkey. I really don't think that this was something that started out. Was it a, was it a miscalculation? I would possibly say so. But so it, it would be important to look at this as even the Iraqi Kurds. Look, on, on June 10th, when Mosul was taken over by ISIL. What were the Iraqi Kurds even saying very close to it? We're not getting involved. They knew about this. And even they said two weeks later, we had no idea that it was going to turn out to be this way. And I think that that's the case with Turkey too. Secondly, I just don't see uh, the PKK, PYD's agenda has always been one of whether it's, you know, challenging the territorial integrity of Turkey, even though it's changed, why would Turkey, whose aim was to disarm the PKK, now want to see arms possibly getting to the hands of the PKK? So this is, this is a very difficult political situation that I don't think it's so clear-cut in saying either you choose the PYD or you choose ISIS. There are two different challenges right now, neither one of which you know, lessens the significance of the other. I would like to respond. First of all, the jihadist fighters, uh, I understand Europeans or Americans, any jihadists from these countries, they can travel and nobody should be stopped because they have beard. That's certainly, uh, I agree with you. But the bulk of these fighters are non-European or non-Western people. So they are Tunisia, uh, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Afghanistan, Pakistan. So uh, China, these people are from this, and, uh, and the international media has covered this enough. I don't want to uh, spend any more time on this. So Turkey could have done a great deal of uh, think, uh, steps to, to prevent. So this is already uh, established by the international community that Turkey did not do enough. Second point, the PYD, by their own official statement, it's they, uh, uh, based on what, for example, you call it P, uh, PKK. They, they don't hide, they are inspired by Öcalan, which is the leader and PKK and uh, PKK aligned organizations. But PYD is a Syrian or Kurdish organization. They don't hide Öcalan. They, they, they say Öcalan inspired us, yes, that's true. But it's a, PYD is a Syrian Kurdish organization. Plus, all throughout all my uh, speech, I'm talking about Syrian Kurds. The, 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 uh, the government that Kurds established autonomy, there are more than, uh, although the P PYD is the main power, uh, I, I acknowledge that, everybody knows that, but there are other uh, parties as well. I talk about Syrian Kurds, some two or three, hundred, three million people that who are uh, suffering because of the embargo. Uh, but it's not the issue of PYD, it's a matter of Syrian Kurds. These people do, do, uh, have Kurds suffered from the Baathist regime very badly or not? Do they deserve some studies or not? So these are the questions. And Turkey being the hosting some uh, 20 million Kurds, 
some say even more, Kurdish uh, nationals say more, government says less. So the direct relatives of your own citizens, why not to welcome them? Why not to uh, make them feel that they are uh, valued? Why treat them uh, with a negative attitude? So nobody tells Turkish army to go to uh, uh, Syria and fight. That's not the case. But there are other ways you could help. There are, you, you could ease the border. So you keep uh, saying PYD, PYD. Syrian Kurds are not only PYD. PYD is the strongest, strongest political party, but the, the YPG is composed of many people that, who are not PYD, PYD opponents, and there are other people, uh, even the Syrian Kurdish National Council, they all say that, you know, Kurd, Turkey could have done better, we want better relations with Turkey. So Turkey should, seeing this perspective, treat them as Kurds, brother and sister of my own citizens, who are suffering, not a political party, and if that is the case, why, you know, why the government officials are talking to Öcalan now, the PKK's leader? So this is another dilemma here. If, if uh, uh, PYD's relationship is, uh, with PKK is the sin, then uh, why, how come there is a peace process or brotherhood process, whatever it's called? So there is a contradiction here. Either that is not sincere or it shouldn't be crime that PYD considers Öcalan its own uh, inspirational leader. Okay, so uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, again, if I could remind you, um, if you're called upon, we'll try and get to all of you because we have plenty of time. Please introduce yourself briefly, where, what you're affiliated with or who you're affiliated with, uh, your name and who you are directing the question at and with as many minimal comments as possible, please. So if we could have uh, Ambassador Holmes here, take the first question. And we'll take one from this side, the, uh, the lady at the back there. Oh, Jim, the microphone's right next to you. Two brief questions. The first one uh, for Mutlu. Um, what is the topography of a place like Kobani that makes uh, airstrikes more or less useful? You appeal for airstrikes in Kobani. What, what is the lay of the land uh, there? Secondly, for Qadir, whose voice matters in the terms of policy formation in, for Turkey? Uh, with respect to um, uh, the, the, the situation in both Iraq uh, and, and um, Syria uh, on uh, um, the Kurds. Is it only one voice now, uh, with, as is popular perceived, that there's only one voice that matters in Turkey? Or is there a multitude of voices that are formulating this policy? Is MIT um, uh, uh, formulating policy? Where, where does the, where's the, 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 the best touch point? with respect to understanding policy formation on this issue in Turkey. Okay. And the lady at the back there, if we could also get her question. Hi, I'm Andrea Petrani from the Cyprus Embassy. Um, my question is in terms of Ankara's thinking about what happens um, in a few years' time, because, I mean, Secretary Hegel and other people had said, we'll counter ISIL, maybe it's not now, maybe it's in two to three years' time. Now, a number of coalition partners have said, we're going to be arming and training Kurds, um, and, and some of them are already supplying um, such arms. So what happens once ISIS or ISIL is counted um, with all these people who have military training and lots of weapons? And I'm basically directing my question to Kadir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if we could have uh, Kadir first and then Mukul second. Okay. So if I didn't misunderstand, you're asking about the decision-making mechanism in Policy Turkey. Policy formulation. Policy formulation, okay. Well, um, there's the, obviously the, the government with its ministers and etc. There's the National Security Council, which includes the president and military leaders. Uh, there, is the, there are all those mechanisms and uh, Davutoglu, you know, met uh, undersecretary, uh, MIT's undersecretary, Hakan Fidan, and um, the president, uh, Erdogan. These are always in close collaboration. So, I... Excuse me. I, yes. I, I fully <laughs> Yeah, excuse me. I fully understand the formal mechanisms. That, that, that what I'm asking for is your insight into where does the policy come from now, with respect to these issues. Is it is it really generated through these formal organizations, or is this smoke and mirrors? And the, there's only one voice that matters on this. One voice of your Erdogan, Erdogan right? Yes. <laughs> 
Uh, very respectfully, I think this is a bit of a simplification. I think there, are, uh, there is, you have your, in, like in all states, you have the intelligence, you have the political, uh, the government who formulates the political aspects, etc. But when, it, when the situation like Syria happens now, it's heavily securitized. So you can say, yes, MIT has a lot more involvement and feedback about what to do in Syria. And that will probably uh, make Turkey uh, adopt a more sort of securitized and defensive posture in this time. But when, when the Arab Spring came up, right, uh, the, there was no civil wars, uh, there were some emergence of conflicts, but you had the more uh, diplomatic political side becoming dominant. So I see, I would say it really depends on the issue, but with respect to foreign policy, overall foreign policy formulation, Davutoglu has been very, very, you know, central to this effort. Who makes the final decision? That's, you know, obviously hard to say, but there is a prime minister that makes, that's the head of the executive, that's why I'm saying there are formal mechanisms. He will make the final decision, but these figures are, are in uh, constant uh, collaboration and cooperation about how to formulate policy. But um, I would say the, if the situation, we have to look at the Kurdish thing. For instance, the evolution of Kurdish peace process is a good example of this. Um, until recently, it was uh, Beshir Atalay, who was, the, um, who was the deputy prime minister, who was responsible under Erdogan government, the previous government. He was uh, sort of responsible for that folder, but now it's it's been elevated to prime ministerial uh, premiership level. So, and there are uh, four deputy prime ministers, and then there are other ministers, including economy minister Ali Babajan and others, who are meeting every two weeks to discuss the Tur Kurdish peace process. So you see it becoming much more secretive and more focused on security aspects, and now it's being broadened towards uh, the political. Uh, so, and the reverse happened with Syria. So. Uh, I don't know if this is satisfactory as an answer, but I, this is how I kind of see. Uh, of course, Erdogan is very central to Turkish politics now. There is no question about that. Uh, armed groups, uh, as I said, I mean, haphazard arming the groups, vetting of them, arming them, that's not going to solve this problem, and it will c create further problems in the medium and long run. Uh, and the president's examples were not very good examples. Somalia and Yemen as, as successful examples of counterterrorism. I understand he means sort of you were able to, this is a, this is a counterterrorism strategy, which means you have to, uh, hate to say this, but you have to kill a lot of people basically. You're, you're going after the terrorists and you're killing them. But, what does that amount to politically? It's an open-ended question. And without that, arming XYZ group won't uh, solve the problem. Uh, and I didn't mean to imply uh, that Turkey should choose between PYD or ISIS. I was just, uh, you know, it's a thought experiment. So. Denise, do you have anything to chime in to this before we pass on to the No, I just want to add about the, the arming of whatever these foreign fighters, you know, just if we really, if people are very much aware that there's not going to be an ideal situation here, okay? And that, again, even this weapon, in addition to what Qadr is saying, it's not only whether you should arm or not, but if you're going to arm, what's going to be the nature of the weapons and, and how effective will they be? We're talking about heavy weapons. Are we talking about training a few thousand soldiers? Um, where, where, how effective will it be, and who is, and, and where the arms will eventually end up for what perspective, what objective? We're still not sure. 
because the objective in Syria among several groups, as, as, as Dr. Ustin said, this is, some of them just want to overthrow Assad. Well, overthrowing Assad for some groups is not the same objective as degrading ISIS in and of itself. And I cannot ascertain, and I don't think anybody can, that those weapons being used to, to push back or degrade ISIS it, are not going to be used by those groups against uh, a larger mission. And this is where it's going to get really messy. I'm not saying not to do it, but it's going to be messy anyway because the objectives and the strategy is not the same among all the groups. Uh, I want to uh, respond to your question, your answer. The, the topography of Koban is pretty straight. It's plain, lack of mountains. It's not like uh, Iraqi Kurdistan region or some parts of uh, Kurdish region in Turkey. It's plain straight, even very few uh, hills. So uh, the majority of Kurdish lands, with the exception of Afrin, are quite pretty straight. So uh, it's quite suitable for air strikes. There is no, no, nowhere that, that, can be, uh, that could hide. Everything is there. Uh, ISIS. Uh, power ISIS vehicles are all visible. And the appeal was, and not my appeal, I just forwarded, conveyed the local officials, Kurdish officials appeal that they demanded uh, airstrikes to Koban. It was not my personal, I just uh, conveyed what I, uh, they told me when I spoke to them this morning. Okay, let's have another round of questions. Uh, we have Nick at the back there and a the gentleman in front of him. And then we'll take one here from the front, this lady here. So if you could do two at the back there. Hello, Nick Danforth. I'm in the history department here at Georgetown. Uh, a question for anyone who thinks they have an answer. Under what circumstances would the Turkish government be willing to accept some kind of settlement in Syria that left the Assad regime with a degree of power? Okay, uh, let's have this lady at the front here and then the gentleman in front of Nick. Hi, I'm Nori Casting. I'm also a graduate student here at Georgetown and I want to thank everyone for their comments and insights. Um, my question is for Dr. Natalie um, regarding the, the KRG and the prospects for independence at some point. I was wondering if you could comment on the, the energy situation, the oil exports, <laughs> the pipeline that um, was built between Turkey and the KRG and the exports of, of oil. Um, I know there's a lot of legal ramifications, but aside from that, I was wondering how you see that affecting mm -hmm. politics in the region. Hi, my name is Nick also. <laughs> and uh, kind of building off that question, um, a lot of people are talking about, you know, Turkey is hesitant to engage ISIS. Um, do you think that that might change if the Kurdish regional government in Iraq really comes under significant threat um, by ISIS, given the energy relation? Um, and just kind of a I personally believe the pressure on the Syrian Kurds does not bode well for the Iraqi Kurds, given that the Syrian Kurds were sending a fair amount of support to them earlier, a couple months ago. Okay, thank you. Move the panel. Uh, Denise? You want to... Certainly. Um, KRG oil, uh, Kurdish oil. Let, I want to put some separate fact from fish, fiction. First, we've heard the, the media, it's been hysterical, this so-called independent pipeline. Now, there is a, a pipeline north coming out of Iraq to Jahan. This is called the Iraqi-Turkish Pipeline. This is an agreement signed between the government of Turkey and Iraq in 1973, renewed, indicating clearly that all fluids inside the pipeline belong to the government of Iraq and only the Ministry of Oil can ship it out. This is the basis of the legal issue. And it's been renewed in 2010 for another 25 years, 15 years, 10 year renewal, okay? Now, this pipeline that the Kurds built, we have to differentiate between what is a feeder pipeline. It was a pipeline built inside the Kurdistan region. The Kur there's two parts, excuse me, let me jump back. This Iraqi Turkish part, there's two parts to it with a million 600,000 nameplate capacity. Two different pipelines, okay? One runs part of it through the Kurdish region, another run parts through Mosul, which is what Al-Qaeda got its hands on years ago. And this has been bombed since two, 20, 2003. Nonetheless, the Kurds confiscated the part in their side because the Iraqi government no longer had reach, blocked it off so that no oil from from Kirkuk could flow when it was controlled by the Iraqi government and connected their own feeder line to this pipeline. 
So I've you know, questioned how independent is the line, not only for legal purposes, because it is still part of the Iraqi-Turkish pipeline agreement. This is the source of why the Iraqi government went to Paris, the ICC in Paris, and, 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 and lodged this dispute. With that said, the Iraqi state, or the Iraqi government, excuse me, has lost a lot of control of the northern regions, not only since 2003, but particularly since this ISIL. Now, the, Iraq, the Islamic State, and we can go back, uh, Al-Qaeda, since 2003, has bombed that pipeline numerous times. This is business for Al-Qaeda, ISIS. Their business is, pipelines put them out of business, the, the very complicated and complex uh, smuggling of oil operations that is feeding and fueling ISIS today is rooted in this smuggling network and bombing out the pipeline so that ISIS can get trucks and truck oil out. ISIS lives on, tr on trucking oil and smuggling it out. Iraqi Kurds since, so there's been, one, as you said, there have been legal issues. And I hate to say this, but the math just doesn't add up in terms of the Kurds trying to ship it out independently. After the, uh, the ISIL takeover, that pipeline and the pumping stations have been completely destroyed to the point where it's going to take a couple of years, supposedly, to fix it. As of today, the only pipeline that's actually functioning to get any oil out of the north is the pipeline on the Kurdish side. Okay, it still has the legal restrictions, however. And secondly, the Kurds have taken over parts of, of Kirkuk. Where has that left the Kurdistan region? Now remember, there's also ISIL going into some of the disputed areas where two key oil fields that Kurds had, the Exxon field and the, and the Hunt field. Most of the large oil companies have evacuated out. Some of them ca came back that are not in the disputed territories. So there's been an overall significant drop in investment. There's no new investment. Those producing fields, and it's a very small level, 120,000 barrels per day, continue to come out of these two fields. Okay? That continues. That has not stopped. <coughs> the problem, however, and there has been brinkmanship, the oil's going out, it's going to Jahan, it's being put on tankers. I don't know if you're following it. There's the story of the, the many tankers out at sea. Radars shut on, radars shut off, off of Texas, not off of Texas. Now they're going to China. You know, and there's, the, the point is this. It doesn't matter if it's 10 million right now or 2 million. The goal of de-risking, how do you de-risk Kurdish crude so that you can assure large-scale oil exports. That was the whole goal. And none of this, Brinkman, has, has assured that. It's actually undermined. It's very opaque. So this whole bit has not reassured investors. It has not reassured buyers. And in fact, those buyers who once did buy Kurdish crude said, we'll never do it again because we didn't know. So there's a real pickle that the Kurds are in right now, and that is the hope of replacing the 95% of their budget from Baghdad that totals about $14 billion hasn't even come close. What has happened over the last six months since Baghdad cut the budget and Kurds started? The Kurds have borrowed at least $2 billion from Turkey. They borrowed billions from other investors. So there's now debt financing here. There, there, there's a, a very, very serious financial situation in the Kurdistan region. With the new government, sorry it's taken so long, they're back to negotiating, and lo and behold, they may recognize SOMO once again um, so that these oil... And, and, and here's the final point. This is not just between the Kurds in Maliki or the Kurds in Baghdad. Whether or not the Kurds are demanding to export all of their oil independently, there's 15 other provinces in Iraq, and the oil-producing provinces in the south don't agree with this because they want the same good deal that the Kurds have. So I don't see any Iraqi president, it's not even the Iraqi prime minister, if this is going to be put to parliament, I don't see how any Iraqi right now is going to allow the Kurds to export independently if they're not contributing back to the Iraqi government. This is the problem. Thank you. Uh, Kadir? Uh, with respect to the cir circumstances under which Turkey would expect, you know, to would accept some some other formula than Assad regime uh, leaving. Uh, I I think that's that's not a. I mean, the fall of the Assad regime is at this point neither you know realistic or imminent. 
And I don't th I think Turkey realizes that. And, Tur <laughs> and when you look at Turkey's approach, uh, the evolution of it, the beginning, you know, Tur for a while they engaged the Assad regime and told them how to, you know, lead the way, lead the country to a to an election process and etc. When conflict started, uh, they said, okay, at least remove Assad, have somebody else uh, bring in the opposition, and cre but still go to elections eventually. So um, there has to be some sort of transition. That's the core point. It's not Bashar al-Assad himself. That's you know that's a problem for Turkey. There has to be a meaningful transition that will end the civil war. It's not a matter of you know, regime change for the sake of regime change. It's not an ideological thing for Turkey. The way to get to stability and to, the, the, and to end the civil war, you need a, seri a, a real transition in the country, in the political structure. And that's neither imminent nor, you know, uh, probable anytime soon when also so many groups are, th including the Assad regime, thinking that they're winning. When everybody is thinking that they're winning, you're not, they're not going to come to the table. So one formula is actually put real pressure uh, by, you know, d d diplomatically, politically empowering the opposition to force the Assad regime to come to the table. But right now, that's not really the focus of, uh, of anybody. If you can bring them to the table and impose some sort of agreement and go to a transitional government and go to elections, things won't still be settled, probably. Uh, we know that from Iraq, how things turned out. So it's not going to be a happy ending anytime soon, I'm afraid. I'm just a verge of it. I just don't see uh, President Erdogan or Prime Minister Davutoglu accepting Assad. I mean, they got pretty much what they want with Maliki gone. And there is a momentum here in Syria if this continues. I, I mean, I don't see what, what uh, Turkey can do in terms of, you know, having Assad overthrown. But this is personal. This is vitriolic and personal, the way that it was with Maliki. So, I mean, I, I think they'll wait it out, but I think time is on, on Turkey's side. But I, I'm not saying that Assad's going to go. I just don't see uh, uh, Turkish leaders turning around and saying, golly, uh, we, we really made a mistake, so let's try to just deal with Assad. I, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about that. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Sorry. Very quickly, if KRG is under threat, would Turkey... Oh, yeah. no, Go ahead. But, well, you know, this is a great question because what you're hearing in the press, my answer to you is no. And this is not surprising. So this is interesting. Some of the Kurdish leaders on the Barzani side, Netrevan Barzani, Fuad Hussein, they just made these statements in the press. We're very disappointed with Ankara that you didn't come defend us against ISIL. Well, well first of all, Ankara couldn't come to the coalition's defense against ISIL as long as it had hostages. But nonetheless, um, you know, this is a bit surprising because there's, there's a, many people who kind of knew this all along. So I think this is more part of the, the Iraqi Kurds have miscalculated, misinterpreted, and overstepped uh, how far Turkey will go. And quite frankly, Turkey doesn't need to. Uh, at this point, the Iraqi Kurds have become so indebted and so dependent upon Turkey that even if they're a, a little bit disappointed or, or upset or angry even, I, I don't see how that's going to significantly affect the alliance because the leverage is not in the, in the Iraqi Kurds' hands uh, at this point. Uh, does that mean that Turkey will not be involved, that it always has been, in terms of surveillance, in terms of reconnaissance? Certainly. But launching a mission against ISIL is the same type of um, pressures that Turkey would face for not becoming actively involved in the international coalition against ISIL. There's some very sensitive issues. But I don't see how the KRG is going to rank high on Turkey's military intervention list if it couldn't even do it in Syria. And don't forget Turkish popular support or domestic opinion. I mean, that matters as well. Just a very quick note on that. When U.S. 
helped KRG. Turkey didn't object it publicly. Uh, but it did object, it actually raised questions about Baghdad being, you know, getting a lot of help from uh, the U.S. because that could perpetuate Maliki's policies if the new government isn't able to. And it raised concerns about also, you know, PKK getting their hands on these weapons, but it didn't raise it with regard to KRG. So there's probably some sort of, you know, U.S., KRG, Turkey, uh, tacit uh, agreement on something yeah. on this. On this. Okay, yes, uh, we have a gentleman here in the front or near the front. Anyone on this side? And then we have one more person at, at the front here. Hi, my name is Tim Hammond. I am an analyst with the Center for Advanced Operational Culture Learning with the United States Marine Corps. And I was wondering for anybody who can answer what narratives and perspectives are at play from a Kurdish perspective on the southeastern Anatolia project, both within Turkey's borders and south of the border, as it will affect the, the flow downstream. You could give the Hi, my name is Matthew Larson, and I'm an undergraduate student here at Georgetown. I was wondering if anyone on the panel could comment about how Iran is becoming involved in the fight against ISIS and if that complicates the relationship with Turkey or the U.S. or the Kurds. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, anybody from the... Well, could you go with this? Well, uh, GAP project, right? Um, Honestly, I don't, I don't know what, it, do you mean it, they see it as a problem or I, I'm not sure about what you mean, how they view it. So, economic and agricultural. Look, yeah, for now, since 2000, January 2013, it's almost two years now, there is a peace process. Uh, secret talks, now it's evolved into a political dialogue, etc. And it's about to, it's been legalized. And there is um, probably a, a going to be an open um, negotiation process. Uh, and there will, the ultimate goal is to address the Kurdish population's demands in Turkey and ultimately disarm PKK. Maybe across the border it won't be realistic anytime soon, but within Turkey, the, the their withdrawal and then disarmament of PKK. But these two years have allowed uh, a lot of politics to take place without the arms, which means uh, both Turks and Kurds inside the country, especially in the southeast, they're very, they're enjoying this lack of fighting. There's been some clashes, there have been some, you know, uh, problems, uh, we can get into that separately, but this process has allowed that to happen, which means that nobody wants to really uh, give up the peace process right now, uh, and they don't want to be the one who's, you know, giving up on the peace process. So, along with this, there have been a lot of sort of economic uh, opportunities in the, in the southeast for all sorts of Kurdish and Turkish businesses and that they have thrived. Uh, Gap project is, a, is an old project so I, I think it's fine in terms of because the, the region is underdeveloped compared to the rest of the country so people are happy if there's more uh, progress on that front, but if we go back to fighting, if the peace process collapses, uh, which it could, um, then that's going to be a problem. Uh, Iran said it won't co cooperate with the U.S. on ISIS, uh, and they see them as, as an enemy, but uh, right now it's the Kurds faced with ISIS, um, Maliki government, they're, I mean, Iran is supporting Maliki government and Iran Pakistan. has good, I mean, the Baghdad Pakistan. government. Uh, I guess we're obsessed with them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, Iran has good ties with KRG, so I don't know how, uh, I think they're not fighting. Um, 
they're not fighting ISIS uh, directly at this point, Iranians themselves, but they're trying, they're supporting the Baghdad government, I think. So. Can I put a little meat on that? Um, one, the Iranian relationship with the Iraqi Kurds goes long back, and it's with the larger Iraqi, uh, Kurdish uh, government as well, but particularly uh, with the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. Uh, the president of the Kurdistan region, Masoud Barzani, made a clear statement in the press that the first country that supported the Kurds, that was invaluable, was Iran. The first country that provided weapons to the Kurds was Iran. And during this period right now, the Quds forces or some parts of them are working and fighting with the PUK in different areas, particularly in the Diyala area. Remember, some of the U.S. airstrikes that initially went in were largely in that, that area of Sinjar. This is the Barzani area. They were not going to any of these parts of the Diyala where the PUK was fighting. So it, 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 I don't mean to simplify this and say, well, there's the PUK area and the KDP and the PUK is with Iran. But nonetheless, these old historical rivalries have been reinforced. And it's actually furthering the, the disunity and the fragments uh, between these two, very deep divides right now between these two parties. So Iran is very much active. It's really nothing new. I mean, there's, there's, there, except now it's on a security level. In this last very important battle at Amerli, which is a Shia town of Turkmen, uh, the Iranians were essential with the PUK and the Iraqi security forces in pushing back ISIS in this area. So indirectly, as, as Dr. Ustin said, there, there's no uh, uh, official and there's not an alliance between the United States and Iran, and Iran is not part of the coalition, and Iran has not been invited. However, by coincidence or by virtue of the fact that they're both on the working toward the same goal, Iran is doing some of the work that the United States is not doing in some of the areas. The Iraqi Kurds are, are an ally and a key ally in the United States' aim to push back and degrade ISIS. Um, part of that is not reaching all of the areas and the, and the PUK is working with, and this is part of it. So I don't see this necessarily as a threat to Turkey. I mean, Iran is not going to replace Turkey. There always have been competing spheres in the north and competing areas, and that will likely continue. Um, but I think the Kurds are playing on this too by trying to say, look, it was the Iranians that came to our defense, not the Turks. And again, I don't see how that's going to change the Kurds' calculus because they still need Turkey in a different way. But, but don't undervalue th this role of Iran uh, in working with the Kurds because they continue to do that uh, today. Yeah, I was also going to mention the Amerli village in uh, Mosul that Iranians play the vital role. And uh, also, I think, in my view, Iran enjoying uh, the, what ISIS is, the, the current situation of ISIS. Iran is one of the biggest bene uh, benefactors because the uh, Assad regime, uh, I, to me, uh, Assad's biggest diplomatic uh, achievement is that he was uh, successful to uh, offer himself as the best alternative uh, in Syria uh, through supporting the radical groups. Now many people start to question that really maybe it's better as that uh, stays. So this, is, uh, this also has been done thanks to help of uh, Iran. Iran enjoys uh, it. The more uh, uh, extremist groups are stronger, the more Assad uh, is uh, more viable uh, alternative. More, uh, so I think Iran is enjoying right now. It, because it serves Iran's benefit, and it also takes some attention, some pressure from Iran in international uh, community, the uh, nuclear program and others. Now the international community is busy with uh, ISIS. Any, okay. Any other questions that you're dying to? Okay, if I may end with one final question, with just brief comments from each of the panelists. Would be, I think I would just like to ask uh, on, the, on the notion of how you would evaluate public opinions. So, Kadir, in terms of um, the Turkish public's uh, sort of, what is the situation of public opinion in, and how far is, does that have an effect on what, how Turkey will act towards this in terms of whether, how, how they will participate in the coalition in, 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 what's, in whatever sense, but what, what is the role of public, Turkish public opinion uh, with respect to the AKP government's um, continued uh, role with respect to ISIS. And Denise, I, I don't know if this relates to what you might want to answer, but in terms of U.S. public opinion, I mean, um, to what extent is the United States government constrained or um, uh, at liberty to act more aggressively with respect to uh, public opinion with regards to President Obama's um, increased uh, role 
uh, that's been defined for the U.S. military in the region. And Mutlu, again, I, I just want to sort of get your sort of take on um, public opinion in Syria. What is the expectation um, on the part of the Kurds that you've been outlining with respect to expectations of the international community at large? And we can end on that, I think. Thank you. Uh, so reverse round, let's begin with Mutlu this time. Okay, sure. sure. Uh, like I tried to uh, mention uh, previously, the, Kur the Kurds in Turkey, uh, their expectation is that uh, Turkey uh, actively takes part in the uh, efforts against ISIS. Any efforts that uh, destroy, weaken ISIS, they want Turkey to uh, take part. Like I said, the, the Turkey is not taking part so far. It's a matter of question. So like Dennis also mentioned, uh, the hostage issue, it was a uh, understandable concern. Now that that is gone, so the expectation is even more that uh, Turkey does uh, something uh, t against ISIS in regards to Kurds, especially uh, stop uh, turning a blind eye or supporting uh, ISIS. Uh, the, the, the border gates that under ISIS control, Akçakale uh, being one of them, uh, there are still uh, allegations that people are easily going back and forth to ISIS militants. P uh, perhaps that can be uh, further straightened. And uh, uh, with Kurds, in regards to Kurds, there might be a you know, better mechanism to work with Kurds rather than seeing them as a danger threat. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, an it's an opportunity for Kurds that Turks have the other side of the uh, border rather than extremists, in my view. Now, if the Kobani city falls, ISIS will have a border town with a NATO country. It's not going to benefit Turkey, uh, like uh, some panelists also mentioned. Uh, so nobody predicts what is ISIS going to do. Who can predict ISIS is not going to do some more in Turkey, damage Turkey? But why not uh, securing the border with, a, with people that... Uh, who, uh, who gave positive messages to you from the very beginning, tried to have good, uh, good relations with you. I think Turkey should see this. Turkey should just hold the, the hands that Syrian Kurds have been trying to uh, reach them. This might be a better uh, the further uh, uh, relation between Turkey and Syrian Kurds. And also, the uh, Turkey Kurds right now, there is an enormous uh, discontent among the Kurds of Turkey in regards to the situation in uh, Kobani and other parts of uh, Kurdistan of Syria. This will also ease the population, Turkey's own Kurdish population, seeing that the government and the, the government is uh, getting better relations with their brethren in Syria. That will uh, further uh, build trust among the Kurds. But I see at the moment there is a, a, a many buses pouring into uh, Suruç, the border town with uh, Kobane, uh, to protest. So the situation is getting very very tense because people are really uh, threatened that. The, their bre uh, brethren in Kobani is under attack, and it's happening uh, direct or indirect help of Turkey. Denise? Certainly. Um, I want to be clear that when we say the U.S. government, as we all know, we're we talking about the administration, Congress, the State Department, and the Department of Defense. I work for the latter. And as we know, in, in, in the past, even planning the Iraq war, and I was in Iraq for that, so I could speak my own opinion again, there was not necessarily, a, let's say, a, a bridging together of views. And uh, I don't imagine that that's the case today. So it is quite complicated. I think um, that the president, pardon? Sounds like the government. This is the government. So people, people said to me, is the government going to do it? I said, which one? And, you know, who? Um, Congress, you know, I think the pre President Obama has acted very carefully. I think he's doing the right thing in terms of he's got to get congressional you know, support. He's trying to get coalition building internationally. He's reaching out to the United Nations and make sure that this is not going to be a unilateral venture. With that said, interestingly, public opinion, you know, public opinion polls show 65% or more of Americans that support these strikes and the same amount who don't think they're going to work anyway. So, <laughs> you know... So, uh, what, go figure. So I, I can't, I'm not tracing opinion polls, um, but I, I do think that, um, that how the president or how the United States move, moves forward, we're seeing two different theaters. Although we like to, the media and the press, you know, like to say the caliphate, and, you know, Iraq is a different theater than Syria. And you, have you noticed that it was easier to get this coalition together for Iraq, right? I mean, we had the Maliki government changed. We have a new, more, you know, reconcilable Abadi in the new government. And we have a large coalition working. Syria, this has been the same mess as two years ago. 
our regional allies? Who, who looks at Syria? Does this mean overthrow Assad? Who can be in and not in this alliance? So part of the problem I see as well, this public opinion that says, you know, this has been very emotional. This has been about, about the beheadings of, 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 of American citizens. This has been about now the fear of hitting the homeland. A lot of this emotion has been into move fast with airstrikes. But in terms of strategy, there's been a lot more, as you can see, uh, nuanced and very, uh, dis let's say, some disagreement on what we do in Iraq is not necessarily what we can do in Syria. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a really difficult situation for policymakers, but also for getting a coalition together. Last but not least, Kadir. Uh, thank you. I, um, there are just maybe two things. Um, Tur Turkish public opinion has always been quite skeptical of U.S. policies, and that continues to be the case. There are, you know, increases, but I we could comfortably say it's deeply skeptical. So when, you, when the U.S. launches this new strategy, I think uh, there is a lot of wariness about whether, uh, at some point, Turkish public opinion was more like, oh, we are being pushed into a war in Syria by others. Uh, and that, that strain remains, I think, to a, to a certain extent. A lot of people don't want to be doing anything in terms of uh, going into Syria and trying to fix things. Um, and that, you know, the Iraq's, Iraq's story has a bearing on that as well. Uh, there are now almost a million and a half refugees. This is something else that impacts the Turkish public opinion. I think um, not overall, but in certain cities, there is the overwhelming of the public services, and uh, there is the typical anti-refugee attitudes uh, locally. Um, and that some research has been done. It's not uh, like, you know, common Turkish person in the street could easily say, oh, these guys came and everything became worse. But there are studies done in terms of crime and, you know, their demand, their, how much they actually overwhelm the system, etc. Uh, it's not too bad. I mean, Turkey has done a good job in terms of, you know, taking care of that refugee issue. But the refugees now, Turkey's challenge is they're probably not going to be going back anytime soon. So Turkey needs medium and long term policies about how to integrate uh, the refugees because only about I think three four hundred thousand uh, now are in the camps the rest are all around the country uh, um, and uh, you see the uh, but there's also the other side like they're also proud to be sort of you know being able to take care of this because Turkey is a great country and will help the, the ones that are being... So there is also that among the, at least from the uh, newspapers you can see that. But the anti-refugee or anti-immigrant, you know, slash, uh, that, that kind of attitude uh, is there. Um, and this is, this may be contributing the uh, opinion that wants to sort of move back to the EU agenda and et cetera. Some, I think GMF poll on this indicated that Turks wanted to kind of now give more importance to EU because the Middle East is, is, is now going through it. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so if we could conclude by just a couple of announcements. One is just to say um, these uh, timely uh, panels I think will continue so if you're interested in further discussions relating to issues such as this on October 22nd if you follow our mailing lists there will be another panel I think here that we've booked again on the Kurdish opening process on Turkey uh, so if you do, if you're not signed up for our mails please do so um, their registration desk at the back if you just leave your emails with either of us that's fine uh, these are joint um, collaborative efforts with the Middle East Institute's Center for Turkish Studies and the Institute of Turkish Studies based here at Georgetown and we're very proud to bring you these um, uh, uh, these events. But independent of that, uh, please give a very, very warm um, hand to our panel, which have 